A tēnā tātou ko hui hui mai nei o tēnei ahi ahi, anā ka tīma tātou i te karakia, tēnā tātou. Tēnei te manua, tēnei te ora, ko tō manua, ko tōku manua, ko te manua nui o rangi nui i te ui hō nei o papatua nupi i takoto nei. Hau mai he manua kura he ora, uhi wero, hau mai, hau mai te mauri, hau mi e hui e tai ki. Tēnā tātou anō, ko heri aroha tēnā e mihi atu nei ki a koutou. Welcome to you all to who have joined for the second webinar. Please enter your questions in the Q&A section and Linda will put these together at the end of Leone's presentation. Tēnā tātou. So I'll pass it over to Professor Linda Smith who will introduce Professor Leone Pihama. Tēnā tātou. Tēnā koutou katoa, Colinda Smith tōku ingoa. Welcome to the third, or the second of our, I don't know where I got the third from, the second of our webinar series on he waka e ke noa. I'm going to leave to Leone some of the more specific details of he waka e ke noa as a project, but I just want to firstly acknowledge Leone as a, you know, the leading kaupapa Māori researcher who's been working in the space now for decades. I know she's very well known to many of you, uh, but to those of you who don't know, who don't know Leone, I know you're in for a treat and you won't be left with any ambivalence or ambiguity um, afterwards. Uh, Leone is a professor also at Ngā Waiatatui um, at Unitech um, and also works as an independent uh, researcher. So without further ado, I would like to um, bring Leone on and uh, look forward to a chat afterwards. Okay, a koe, Leone. Hi. Tēnā koutou katoa. Tūtahi tēnei ni mahi atu ki a koe hiri aroha. Nau i whakatūwhira tō tātou nei hui. Mai te karakia nō reira tēnā koe. Ki a koe huki, Linda. Mō tō mahi mai ki au i tēnei wā. Huri nō i te whare ipurangi nei. Koutou kua uru mai ki rotu i tēnei whare mō tēnei wā. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko wai tēnei i mahi atu ana ki a koutou, ko Taranaki ko Kariwa i ngā maunga, ko Waitara ko Waikato ngā awa, ko Te Ate Awa ko Waikato ko ngā te mahanga, ngā mahanga taere, ngā iwi, ko ngā te rāhiri te hapu, tēnei te mahi atu ki a koutou katoa, ko Lia Ni Pihama tōku ingoa. So uh, I just want to add my welcome to everyone to the second webinar for He Waka Eke Noa. And it's, um, it's really great to be able to continue to have this conversation after Linda opening uh, last week with the introduction to how we came to this particular project, um, moving from an earlier project, Te Oranga Ngāko, uh, into uh, looking that was looking at Māori understandings and views of trauma-informed care through to alongside the Māori providers we work with, um, further developing it, uh, looking at a range of cultural frameworks in terms of uh, violence prevention and intervention. And um, Iwaka Eke Noa is a, um, a project that you know, has been long in the building, as Linda said, uh, many of you work in this field as practitioners. Uh, there are a number of people that are on the webinar that provide support through rangaha or through research. Um, and uh, so it's really kind of building on all the work that collectively we've been doing as Māori in terms of well-being. So a lot of this is not new. Uh, we know that. And, and some of it for, um, for Hiwaka Ekenoa, the team particularly, 
is documenting things that our people are already doing. And that's something that uh, the two key providers that we're working with, um, Te Puna Odanga in Otautahi and Te Waipaunamu and Tuta Mawahini Otaranaki, you know, said to us at the very beginning of the project is around documenting the work that our people are doing uh, in terms of well-being uh, and having that available not only to us, but but adding to the evidence base that many people have been developing over time. So this presentation uh, is really focused on whakatauki and whakatauaki, and it's really looking at the whakatauki and whakatauaki that um, were raised by whānau, uh, by Māori organisations, uh, engaged in uh, violence prevention and intervention in the various corridors or the whakawhiti corridors or the interviews, the conversations that we have had over the past three years. And um, so I've titled this particular presentation, Kamua Kamudi, Looking to Our Past to Move Forward. And it's um, continuing on some work around whakatauki that we've done uh, previously around tamariki order. Um, so whakatauki and whakatauaki as inspiration and guidance uh, for our people. Uh, many of the whakatauki shared by participants are familiar to all of you. And so we're really looking at it in the context of um, the kind of family violence prevention work. As Linda said, the Hiwaka um, Ikenoa is a Kaupapa Māori research project. Uh, there is a, a survey section that um, Shirley Simmons will speak to next week around uh, prevalence of family violence and sexual violence, but also around the impact of community violence and state violence. And we've done, uh, around Waitangi Day, we did a conversation with Radio Wātea and Tao, uh, Māori Television around some of the outputs of that uh, particular part of the survey, identifying the ongoing impact of state violence which we know in um, a lot of the mahi done by our people and particularly around the, um, the Kruja report, the Transforming Family Violence, Whānau Violence Report, there was a strong identification of the impact of state violence on our people. Uh, and many uh, people working in the field have talked about state violence as being a really um, significant impact in terms of the ongoing perpetuation of Fano violence. So seeing state violence as a mean, as a way in which the state perpetuates violence upon whānau. Um, just quickly, the research team, and, and we'll make this available um, through the registration process, email it out. Uh, but you can see uh, there are names that are familiar to people working in the field. Uh, and um, we have two uh, research advisors, one national, Henebirangi Kohu Morgan, uh, who is familiar to most people working in this field, um, and Professor uh, Bonnie Duran, who's out of Seattle, who does work in historical trauma and coined um, uh, one of the terms with Eduardo Duran around the, the notion of the soul wound. So the Kaupapa Māori principles, for those of you who are familiar with our work, is what grounds and frames the mahi, um, tildanga, tiratanga, whānau, kaupapa, and um, so the first six come from the work of Graham Smith, uh, and, and that has framed Kaupapa Māori theory methodology uh, since the 80s. And uh, also the notion of ata, the principle of growing respectful relationships, that comes out of the work of Taina Pohatu. Uh, and those working particularly in uh, the social work field uh, are very, um, are often quite uh, knowledgeable of this notion of ata, as he has talked about it in terms of particularly training through Te Wānanga o Te Ro. So those are the principles that guide the work. Te Waka Iki Noa, uh, as a title, you'll see that actually there are whakatauki and whakatauaki that run throughout the entire uh, work. And we chose the term Hewaka Ikenoa to title the project. It's, it's a very familiar whakatauki. Uh, and as um, Matua Hiri Nimoko Mead uh, in, in his publication with Grove in 2003 talked about Hewaka Ikenoa as a canoe to be used without restriction. 
the proverb underlies the fact of community ownership. So people often translate it in terms of all being on board, eke nor being on board. Um, and the idea in this particular translation is that the idea of being without restriction means that it points to the, to the notion that, that this is a walker to be used by all. And so it emphasizes communal use and ownership. And that's really what we were wanting to do with Hewaka Ekeno, was to emphasize our collective and community ownership of how we move forward, how we take this waka forward in terms of this mahi. Um, so within Kaupapa Māori, we're aware that all of those principles are all aligned to Mātauranga Māori. And we have developed a publication uh, related to the various whakatauki and whakatauaki that Fano talked about in the project. And in that, Linda uh, writes about Mātauranga Māori as being a system of knowledge, the knowledge of everything, the organising principles for making sense, including the methodologies of everything we may seek. And so, of course, it brings a really broad notion, a really broad idea to how we think about Mātauranga Māori, that Mātauranga Māori is, is a Māori system, indigenous system of knowledge that enables us to do and understand and investigate and come to know uh, everything that is a part of our world. And one of the whānau uh, that were involved in the project talked about mātauranga in this way. I think that mātauranga is absolutely critical and they're talking about in terms of family violence and sexual violence prevention and intervention. Uh, and, and what they're emphasising here is that the bringing forward of mātauranga Māori as a wellspring of knowledge to help us to address the issues that are at hand, the historical trauma issues, the issues of colonisation, uh, and that it's really significant and important that we bring mātauranga Māori uh, uh, to the forefront of the work. And that's what many type of Māori providers in the field are doing already. And uh, if anything, Hiwaka Ekenora as a project is validating and affirming the work that many of you are doing. So as I said, we did a range of discussions and called all with people around the motu, uh, 60, um, over 60 conversations we had or whakawhiti called all with people. And we asked a number of questions and one, of, one series of questions was around mātauranga Māori where we asked about whakatauki, whakatauki that, that people use in their mahi or that whānau use for healing and well-being and what they meant to them. We also talked about, we asked about pūrāko and uh, for the first time in our particular uh, mahi in this field, we asked about māramataka. And so the pūrāko and māramataka components, I'm not, we're not going to talk to today because they're quite significant, but we're hoping that uh, later on in the series we'll have the opportunity to share um, the kind of pūrāko that people talked about as healing and guiding and learning, but also the way that our people talked about māramataka. And we know that there's been a huge resurgence uh, in terms of matariki, a huge resurgence in terms of māramataka. And um, so that's quite a significant uh, part of the project that we really do want to share um, and hopefully alongside those practitioners who are doing the work in terms of Maramataka. So in terms of Whakatauki, this is a general um, you know, overview of Whakatauki and Whakatauaki, and I'm going to use Whakatauki from this point on um, to avoid the kind of you know, duplication of the term, but, but just making really clear, and many of us are aware of this, the difference between Whakatauki and Whakatauaki is that whakatauki are generally not, the source is not known. Okay, so it's often not, we often can't recall or the source of the actual saying itself. Whakatauaki, with the A, ah, is uh, that we're, we're often, um, with the whakatauaki, we can identify an author or we can identify a source, whether it be a whānau, hapu iwi, or an event. And so the, the distinctions are there. Uh, and from this point on, I'll use whakatauki to talk about both of those. But um, as we've said before, they're often short sayings that they're reflective of people, they're reflective of our relationship of the environment. Um, and often they, well, they have an instructive or educational purpose. 
i.e. they give us guidance and learning. Um, in Alsop and Kupinga, in their book around whakatauki, they talk about whakatauki as a communication form people intuitively know, um, an innate uh, definition that starts with being written in childhood and thereafter refined through life. So they've got quite a broad notion of whakatauki and the way in which people bring it through their lives. And Henny Moore Elder in her publication Aroha talks about whakatauki as nuggets of wisdom that provide life lessons, guidance, notes of caution, and sometimes a source of comfort. So whakatauki really are like pūrāko, and if you're uh, familiar with Jenny Lee Morgan's work in particular around pūrāko uh, and the growing work that people are doing in that field, pūrāko are uh, uh, also have a similar context in terms of mātou ranga māori. They provide us with guidance, they provide us with learning, they provide us with ancestral understandings that can support us in our understanding. Uh, and this is from uh, one of the kaikōrero that talked, one of the whānau that spoke in, in, uh, in the project uh, with the team around the significance of chikanga and significance of whakatauki. And that inside these are the traditional and the customary traditional sayings that we have and values that we have. And they talk about it in terms of whānau utilising whakatauki to respect each other's spaces, acknowledge each other for who we are and what we're discussing, all those kinds of things. And that in bringing forward uh, whakatauki and these sayings uh, into our lives, we're not only bringing the content and, and the presence of those messages but in many ways we're bringing forward the presence of our tūpuna, we're bringing forward the memories that come with those um, and, and the way in which our tūpuna have continually been present in the guiding and uh, guidance through their words but through wairua and in wairua as well. So I wanted to just quickly go over um, some of the whakatauki that were shared um, by people in the, in the project itself. So what we asked is, first of all, we asked, you know, do you, your whanau, or you as a practitioner, draw on cultural knowledge and mātauranga Māori uh, to guide your practice, to guide your understandings, and to guide the kind of changes that you want to make or that whānau want to make in their lives? And, and are there specific whakatauki that you utilise? So this is one, aroha ki te tangata. Some of these uh, that people shared really have come from their own uh, life experiences and have been handed to them either through their whānau or their organisation or through their, their hapu or iwi knowledge. So show compassion to people. And this is what this uh, kaikōri will say about this particular whakatauki. The tikanga around aroha ki te tangata, because we haven't used and identified some of the, those tikanga around the way we treat each other and how we're going. So they utilize this as a way of bringing forward some understandings and thinking about what it can mean in our lives. So it's like it's, it's also, whakatauki can also encourage us and challenge us to think more deeply about what it means to us, okay, what this term means to us respect and aloha for each other, being responsible for looking after ourselves and for each other, being responsible for some of the behaviours that, that, that we have in our lives and that continue to, to need to be addressed within our lives. So aloha ki te tangata is something that's not uh, necessarily a new for Karl and uh, but for them it really was about thinking around not only the tikanga, but also thinking more deeply in terms of family violence prevention and, and intervention. So the concept of haroha, when we look at that and how uh, Fano and, and, and Māori, Kaupapa Māori practitioners talked about their work, they talked about the concept of aloha as being central to working with Fano. That aloha we often talk about as being translated as love or empathy or compassion or caring. And we know that aloha has many layers to it, and that we are also having to decolonize this notion of aroha from the kind of Valentine's Day, um, you know, Hollywood perception of love. And that aroha means much more. When we look at the term aro ki te ha, 
to turn the breath. And so aloha has a whole range of other layers that come with it. So a whakatauki like this it's not only about showing compassion to people, but it's about thinking about the sanctity of those relationships, of the notion of aro and ha, how we bring the breath of life and what this indicates to us, how we turn toward and give respect to and acknowledge the ha that has come through our ancestral whakapapa lines as being inherent to who we are. Mō tato a mō ka uri a muri aki nei for us and for all descendants to follow. So this came from Kai uh, Kōrero from Ngaitahu. If I look at the Ngaitahu for Katauki, Mō Tātou A, Mō Ka Uri, A Muri Akine, for us and our children, the descendants after us, it will it automatically lead you to believe that the Whakatauki is about what's good for us is also good for our children. It's about them. So that you know, that gives us a whole notion of intergenerational relationships and whakapapa relationships. That's important to understand that we have these relationships with each other and that what happens with this generation will impact on future generations. We hear a similar way of um, explaining these whakaro when we listen to... Um, People like Bonnie Duran and uh, Karina Walters, Michelle Johnson Jennings, Tessa Campbell, but native, our native relations that work in the area of historical trauma, who talk about being the relationship between being the ancestor and being the, the descendant, the mokopuna. That we sit here as, as grandparent you know, and, and grandchild, as tupuna and as mokopuna simultaneously. And so what happens for us will impact in terms of what happens for future generations. And so this brings us to, you know, not surprisingly, another uh, whakataiki, he mokopuna, he tupuna, he tupuna, he mokopuna. And this comes from uh, uh, Tutama Wahine or Taranaki from Kaimahi working there. A child, a grandchild is an ancestor and an ancestor as a grandchild. And what they say is there are so many whakatauki and all of it is around tamariki, around protecting our tamariki and the cordial that Tutama Wahine carries. He mokopuna, he tupuna, he tupuna, he mokopuna. The idea that one day our kids are going to be tupuna. When I put that into the context of my life and I look at my tupuna, they are people that were able to conduct tikanga. They were people that understood these concepts quite well and invested the way they knew into their tamariki to be able to carry knowledge. So again, as with the previous whakatauki, you're really bringing forward the significance of the place of tamariki, of our children, mokopuna, and future generations. And that within a tell Māori framework, within a kaupapa Māori framework, that tamariki are considered to be taonga, as we see in Whakatauki, such as Te Taungo Takunako and others, the treasure of my heart, Te Kuku o Taku Manua, the pincer, the one that pinches my heart, all of these Whakatauki around children that show that they draw attention to the sacredness of children and the way in which children provide us with our Whakapapa lines into the future and therefore need to be at the center of our well being. This particular uh, one here, Mokopuna Tupuna, takes it a little bit further in the acknowledgement that we are all ancestors and we are all grandchildren simultaneously. And so the roles that we have, they, they, they mature and they come to life as we grow through. So we, we come in as Mokopuna, who are future Tupuna, who are future ancestors. And so it brings the connection between generations and that this Whakatauki emphasizes that we have all of these roles in our lifetimes. So this came again from a whānau member, but it's also familiar uh, to us that are aware and familiar with uh, Fire Those Pires work. This is something that she would often say, So in this whakatauki, uh, we're acknowledging people, tangata, as being divine beings. 
e dotu i tērā whakatau ki hi ida tangata, a hi ida atua hi ida tangata. Kei dotu i a tātou ngā āhua o ngā atua katoa, atua katoa. Engare kei a tātou ngā tikanga me te mōhiotanga, te whakatipu ngā atua i dotu i a tātou, e hia hea nā ki a whakaputa ki a whai. Anō nei ngā tikanga i dotu i o tātou nei ao, ka whānau te timaiti, haria ia ki te awa, whakatōhia ki ngā atua, i hihi ana koe ki a whakaputa i tō te maiti. So what they're saying in this, uh, in terms of the explanation for this particular uh, whakatauki, is that we are born with either tangata and either atua. We are born as both human and as divine beings. And that within us, we have these ways of being and these characteristics of our atua, of our deities, uh, that are within us. And that it's up to us to bring forward that tikanga, those practices, and to remember those things about how we then grow. We grow those characteristics within our children and within ourselves so that they flourish and so that we see those, so that they come to the fore. And that for some, that means taking a child to the river, taking a child and, and doing dedication ceremonies, doing karakia, doing tohi doing pūri, those, those dedication ceremonies, those karakia, those ways of thinking that enable us to call forward uh, the spiritual side to support that. Nā tō dou dou, nā tōku dou dou, kia ora ai te iwi. And this whakatauki is very well known amongst our people. With your food basket and my food basket, the people will thrive. And this this uh order, this this kai koiro, this speaker and talked about this whānau member talked about na tōdo do na tōku do do. Nana always said that to us as we were growing up. It might be a fakatoki that's always used by everyone. It's on every thesis. It's just as the notion of us as a people. It speaks to collectivism. It speaks to sharing. You've got to have a system that's equal and balanced. That isn't a have to. It is a beauty of being in a Māori collective. I think that it's a philosophy of something that we might not do a lot, but it's something we've got to start to reconsider. I think it's a good whakatauki with environment relationships, like what you're giving each other rather than what you're taking from each other, which is a deficit way of thinking about a violent relationship. What do you actually give each other? What do you share with one another? So this whakatauki, again, is about bringing forward collective well-being and collective well-being sitting at, at, the, at the core of Māori relationships. It's one that's frequently used to emphasise that it's through our collective ways of being, it's through us all bringing to the basket what we have, what we have in terms of our knowledge, what we have in terms of our skills, what we have in terms of our sharing, you know, so that the well-being of all can be achieved. Kia ora ai te iwi. So it stresses the place of sharing resources, in order that people experience the benefit and well-being of sharing and, of, and the well-being of communal acts. And this is something we've seen, you know, continually within Te Ao Māori, and it's a powerful strength we have as is He Waka e Kinoa, our collective ability to come together. And in the last two years around what's been happening with COVID in particular, and this current variation that we're in, we're really seeing the strength of our people come forward in terms of the collective well-being and being well together and caring about each other, particularly those who are most um, vulnerable uh, to the more severe impacts of COVID, that the key uh, for us in the well-being of our people as an iwi, as iwi, hapu, whānau and Māori collectives is actually caring for each other. My language will be shared, my language will, will thrive. This whakatauki, that is thriving, speaking your deo is a form of thriving. Being proud to be Māori is a form of thriving. For thriving. So there's many answers to that. So this is an example of how we bring forward te reo, uh, as a way of thinking about our well-being, thinking of thriving. That, that knowledge of te reo Māori can access us to, to knowledge, to guidance, to practices, to tikanga, to whakatauki, um, that enhances our way of understanding ourselves. 
Okay, that enhances our way of thinking about our place in the world. So it, it brings the link between te reo, language well-being, and the well-being of our people. The need for cultural and language revitalization as a contributor to wider whānau well-being as a strategy in the, in the journey to return to a state of modi order of inherent well-being. The denial of te reo Māori we know had significant impact in terms of colonising and assimilating agenda that was incredibly destructive for our people and caused huge impacts in terms of historical trauma for, our, for generations, particularly our parents and grandparent generations. And the impact of that was incredibly severe uh, for many in terms of the trauma that was continued to be carried. So the importance of, uh, another importance of this is that a number of uh, our people have said very clearly and, and whānau and Māori practitioners in the study, um, you know, really share this idea of bringing te reo Māori and the well-being of te reo Māori closer to the well-being of our whānau. That, that every, you know, in every context we were looking at healing, we need to have the reo. We need to have the reo component. The revitalization of te reo Māori cannot be seen as separate from the well-being of whānau, from whānau, uh, from the from the well-being and the prevention of racism, from the well-being and prevention of violence that is experienced. But that we need to bring these closer together in terms of the healing and being in a in a state of thriving means thriving on every level. Kawe mati fiki me mati ururo. Don't die like an octopus. Octopus die like a hammerhead shark. I know that there is some. I've seen some debate around the role of the octopus, and we know that uh, Fire Rose used te fiki as an incredibly powerful healing tool. Um, and so we're not going to debate that context necessarily now. But but what this is really saying to us is that the hammerhead shark can't stay still. The hammerhead shark has to continue to move in order to survive, it has to be progressing and always moving forward. And so this person, it's always talking about the power of, of moving and going down fighting. So it is about resistance. They are talking in this context. I always think, kawe mati whiki, me mati ururo, go down thinking, I, uh, go down fighting. I do think that. So it's about speaking to the need of maintaining a strength to continue to fight or struggle without giving up. The comparison of the hammerhead shark is an indication to the octopus is an indication our tupuna saw a greater strength in the hammerhead shark, which also had the octopus as one of its prey. This whakatauki is applicable to many contexts, and in this context is to battle through the difficulties, okay, to battle through, to move through the hard times, and to continue to do the work that's required in order to achieve whānau well-being, no matter how hard that may be. So it really is a whakatauki in this context around not giving up. Ko te ira wahine, ko te ira tāne, ka haere ngātahi ai. Māori women and Māori men move together. Anei no anō te tai whakatauki, yahu mai to tātou iwi, ko te ira wahine, ko te ira tāne, ka haere ngātahi ai. Nō te ira iru tui tērā, he mana tō te wahine, ori te ki te mana o te tāne. Ka tai mai ki i nei rā, i aha tēnei mea te gender equity. Kei a mātou ki, me hoki anō ki, tō tātou, ki o tātou nei tikanga nei rā anō. So this is raising, again, uh, raising for us the notion of the relationship in terms of wahine and tāne and the way in which we need to move together that we need to move together in the, in the acceptance and the acknowledgement of the mana, and that there is mana of all tangata. And so it's really referring to this whole notion of challenging, I, I think in terms of the context that we're often in, of challenging the ways in which colonization has reframed mana has reframed mana wahine, has reframed mana tāne, has reframed uh, mana tangata. And that within te ao Māori, the mana of each person is recognised and affirmed and validated. So within the context of whānau violence, what we see is a lot of discussion 
and a lot of impact of the colonizing gendered notions and the roles that come with gender and Western Pākehā uh, imposed and imported gender notions that bring with them a whole range of violence. The nuclear family is one context uh, in particular where gender has played out uh, historically in native schooling and mission schooling. One of the first intentions of schooling, colonial schooling, was to undermine the fundamental relationships that we had as whānau and the way in which we work together as wahine and as tāne. And so within this context, we need to shift that dynamic. We need to decolonize the gender relationships that have been imposed on us and come back in terms of the relationships that we have and the roles that we have are Māori nei in terms of whānau. Utua te kino ki te pai. Respond to evil or hate with goodness. E nui nga whakatauki puta mai taku hine ngaro, uta te kino ki te pai. E ha te mea nui o te ao ko te tangata. E ha te mea nui ko te aroha. E nui no atu nga whakatauki i ki atu tatau, tiwi Māori, whaia e nei tikanga, hei painga mau, mō tō whānau, mō tō hapu, mō tō iwi. Utua te kino ki te pai is a term that we've seen uh, in a whole range of contexts, and it is our reminder to ourselves of actually responding in particular ways to those things that are oppressive to us, to those things that are harmful to us. And to do that in a way that enables us to move forward in line with our own tikanga. So this is, uh, you know, I think often this is seen as a whakatauki that uh, kind of aligns to the notion of uh, kia tau te rangi okay. So kia tau te rangi mādi, do thing, doing things in peaceful ways. But it's not a whakatauki that denies resistance. Utua te kino ki te pai means that we, we respond to harm, we respond to hate, we respond to these within the tikanga process that we have. And we know that within tikanga, that, that way can include a whole range of possibilities, including utu, including uh, muru, and including forms of koha in terms of relationships. So with this whakatauki, this person is really bringing forward the way in which we can respond to violence, the way in which, and, and when we're talking about state violence, we're also talking about uh, notions of racism. We're talking about the ongoing implication of the state's failure to honor the treaty, all of these things is to respond to them in ways that align to what we're doing and to align to our chikanga. We know what is the most important in the world is people. And this person is saying, and that means working in ways that also affirm aroha. Okay? So they're linking together a range of whakatauki. And what is important, that it's compassion, that it's empathy, that it's being careful. Oh, I might. I'm just going to stop this here. Yeah. So what we have, okay, what we've done in the uh, project itself is to continue to look at a range of mātauranga Māori, a range of contexts, including whakatauki and whakatauaki, that give us sets of principles and frameworks for thinking about moving forward within our own cultural frameworks. They give us positive messages, but also give us learnings and guidance for intervention and for, for prevention. The thing around Whakatauki is that they give us these ancestral instructions that are really a clear communication for us, that are a clear learning between our tupuna and ourselves. Now, I also want to say that there are many opportunities for us now, as tupuna, to also be creating whakatauki and whakatauaki for the next generation. 
And I know in the work done uh, by Matra uh, Farihui and Milroy, one of the things that he had been working on was this regeneration of Fakatoki and Fakatoki in a contemporary way that give us contemporary understandings for what we're experiencing now, which is what our tupuna have given us within their Fakatoki and within um, within the learnings that they've that they've given us. So Fakatoki also give us these understandings about about our own worldviews in terms of relationships, in terms of our agency, and I'm not just talking about relationships in terms of human being relationships. One of the things that we see in Fakatoki is the ongoing relationship to um, to Taiao, to Finua, to Awa, to Maunga, to Kararihi, to Manu. Uh, and the ways in which those relationships are as significant to us and defining to us as are our human relationships. And in many ways, colonization has led us into this idea of being human centric and centralizing entirely on ourselves as human beings. I think one of the things that COVID has shown us, and particularly in the lockdown period, if we were aware of what was happening within our tile during the lockdown period, a lot of healing happened for Papa Tuanuku during that time. A lot of healing happened for our awa during that time. And so thinking about those relationships all the time are really critical. So we're, for this project, Kaupapa Māori gives us a set of principles and frameworks and ways of learning and applying Mātūranga Māori what we're looking at in terms of whakatauki and whakatauki is that there's a diverse range that are available to us. These are the ones that we're, these ones we've shared are some that have come and been gifted uh, through the corridor of many whānau and, and many Māori working in the field. But we all have our own and we all have ours that are specific to our whānau, to our hapu and to our iwi. And the way in which we apply those it's going to be dependent on how our understanding of them relates to a particular context. And what we've done here is really we've been asking people about sharing them, sharing their ideas, sharing their whakatauki in terms of how they are looking at healing and how they look to bring whānau order. So I'm going to leave that uh, here for now uh, and just because I'm cognizant of the time uh, and leave a bit of question time. Uh, ngami, tēnā koutou. Uh, tēnā koe, Leone. Thank you so much for that and for sharing um, just the range of whakatauki eh, that came up in the project. I mean, have you got a sense, can you kind of share the, I guess, a sense of the diversity that um, we had in terms of the contributions? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we've got, in terms of Bano that shared, there were, um, you know, it was across the motu, so we travelled across the motu. There were 60 to 80 uh, Fano or Māori providers that shared their whakaro, so it's a very significant group of people. Um, if I was going to say, you know, when we asked the pātai around, you know, do you draw on whakatauki, I would say, you, you know, 90% of those people who shared, and, and the others tended to, were more likely to say, well, I'm aware of the use of whakatauki and I'm working on that. Mm. So pretty much all of our people had something and people were also framing their own kiwaha or their own whakatauki in their own organisations. So it's quite a broad and, and we see it actually growing because we can see the number of publications that are growing. Thank you. Now, I do you have some questions here? So I'm just going to start, um, hopefully we can get through them all before the end of um, our time. So firstly, it's from an anonymous uh, attendee, Peheo Fakaro. I know at times my body reacts to the use of our kōrero and whakatoki, whakatoaki by the, quote, evil administration, unquote, of this country, i.e. government departments. Any tips on how we can challenge this in clever ways, but also keep safe? Yeah, I think it's been an ongoing issue, challenging uh, the use of uh, both our veo, our whakataiki, our, um, our names uh, by particular organisations. And we can say Hioranga Tamariki has been one in particular that has had uh, you know, significant challenge. 
and uh, because we know that that's not what happened in that organization as a whole. Uh, and you know, that's another comment on Māori working uh, in that organization. It's a comment on the structure and the systems. So I think that within each of our contexts, you know, we are, I think it is a part of our responsibility and obligation to, to raise these issues as they come up around us with agencies, with ministries, um, and, and remembering, and particularly when they uh, whakatauki and whakatauki are used in inappropriate ways uh, to push an agenda that is not actually an agenda, that is a kaupapa Māori agenda. Um, and also the sourcing of where it comes from in those, in those uses. I'm also aware that you know, often our people gift names and whakatauki, and so you know, being really cognizant of uh, how that happens, who, who that happens with, and why that's, why that's happening. But I mean, fundamentally, I think until the Crown and its associated agencies and um, you know, other Pākehā organisations actually are having enduring, meaningful, real te te waitangi relationships and partnerships with our people, uh, you know, then any use of whakatauki as a performative uh, process that just kind of gives a superficial performance is not appropriate. And keeping safe is really, um, to be honest, I've never really been safe in this context uh, or felt that at all. I think that when you challenge these things, it's about you having support and doing that with other Māori and other allies in the organisation. Uh, kia tato. I think somehow we've um, lost Professor Linda Smith. So I'll jump in and um, go through to the next question, if that's all right, Leone, and hopefully okay. Linda will, will come mm. back to us. Um, so this question's from Tri, Tri Hana. These whakatauki res resonate strongly with me and my mahi, which I am going to apply more as time goes by, but there are always a sense of anxiety when I have made decisions that protect the cultural interest of people in my care. That make um, in my care that make it necessary to almost over explain the rationale into the managerial space. What is your advice when it comes to communicating well in this space? And she also goes on to say my rationale into managerial space out of my um, I mean, again, I think it's similar to the previous question, and it is about us being really cognizant of the spaces that we're in and how we use uh, our, our tikanga and our mātauranga within those spaces. Uh, and um, in terms of, for me, in terms of uh, how we discuss whakatauki, it really comes down, I think, to the knowledge that we hold ourselves in relation to those particular whakatauki and what it means to us in a way in which it resonates with our work. So, I mean, I know that people have talked about in the in the mahi, you know, actually a lot of the sharing of whakatauki is actually sharing with whānau. It's not necessarily sharing with management. It's actually sharing with whānau and whānau sharing with, with them. And that, that at that level of that kind of interchange between uh, Fano members and between Māori that is most powerful. So I, I, it, it is again around making some, some clear decisions of depending on the organization you're in and how in which, uh, how uh, working in that organization, you know, who is the priority in terms of sharing our tikanga and our mātauranga with. And, and we know first and foremost that's with our own. Um, and, and really being cognizant of, of how we're doing that and, and what the intent is. I think the intention of using, uh, utilizing whakatauki and any mātauranga Māori is really important. Uh, and being, I guess this is where the notion too of ata comes in, in terms of kaupapa Māori, is being really cognizant and deliberate and intentional around what we're doing and why we're doing it. So a lot of that is really reflective uh, in our space. So without knowing the particular space, it's uh, kind of difficult to give a definitive kind of you know, clear answer to that. But that's what I'd say. Be intentional, be deliberate, be clear about the priority and who is the priority around this kind of knowledge exchange and sharing that we do with each other.
You back, Linda? Can you hear me? Hi. I think Hi. I think my computer is kind of dying. <laughs> um, so I've got another question from Tu Wahine, 10, in relation to the use of the Whakatauki as a tool for intervention. I'm interested in how we apply them as a way of working with Fano and particularly Wahine, who are healing from child sexual abuse. Mm. This can at times be much of a process of healing of the individual and the mummy within childhood memories. Utilizing these taonga as a way of retrospective healing of the inner child, which I feel is as relevant to working with these taonga in present spaces. Mm. Has the research looked at the different ways in which these taonga may be used based on the time and spaces where the trauma has originated, i.e., is there a difference in thinking around whakatoki when working with historical trauma versus utilizing whakatoki related to present situations? I mean, that's a really huge uh, question. And um, in short, so. Yes, people were asked about how they utilised uh, these particular whakatoki and why they had these as a particular focus in their mahi. And so we're, we're still yet to do work on that in terms of the practitioner work. And in, in two weeks' time, I think we have uh, Ngāropi Cameron, who's from Tūtama Wahine, who's going to speak more specifically to the application of the work uh, for practitioners. What I do know is that um, when people talked about the utilizing of uh, using whakatoki, so these were just some examples, but what they also said is that there are other examples depending on the context, depending on the context of what was happening in that, in that time with the whānau that they were working with or with the, the person that they were working with. And so for them in doing that mahi, they would draw on whakatoki relative to the particular context of the time. So what I've done today is kind of given a general overview of some of the whakatoki that people have talked about, but there are others as well. And so I think um, when we look at the work from Karina Walters around historical trauma, and I, I want to give Linda some time to speak about this from the He Oranga Ngako project as well, in terms of the trauma impact. But when we look at the work that was done uh, around uh, historical trauma in Seattle, uh, what they said was that there, there, are, there are particular ways in which trauma plays out. And so there are particular cultural frameworks that they will bring forward more in some areas than in others. So um, I'm going to leave it there, but it is something that uh, if you're able to come back on for Ngarupi, uh, she's going to, and then we've got Betty Seal and a couple of others coming, internationals coming in to talk about how they apply their cultural frameworks as practitioners. These first two uh, part I really, uh, these first two webinars were being Linda and I setting the kind of theoretical uh, framework. But I also know that in my own experience, um, Nakatoki have enabled me uh, in my own life uh, to understand uh, more deeply some of the harm and the way in which harm has occurred for our whānau and for individuals within our whānau and where to find some kind of solace and healing and focus to kind of get more of a sense of tau and a more of a sense of modi order um, as we move through those things. But Linda, you might have a reply from the earlier project. Well, this is such a good and important question, isn't it? And um, I think well, firstly, I want to mention the work of um, Cheryl Smith as, as well in this intergenerational trauma space. Um, it's partly around the stories that we can tell, but also around the silences that have been deliberately built into um, the way our intergenerational stories have been passed on. You know, that often we're having to uncover secrets for want of a better term, uncover trauma and try and explain, um, well, at first it's the, why weren't I, why wasn't I told? Why weren't we told? 
but then it's coming to understand that, you know, our tūpuna were also trying to protect us um, sometimes, and other times maybe they simply couldn't speak it. Uh, some trauma silences people completely. So there's a really complicated space. Um, and I think, you know, the work in Hewaranga Ngako, which I spoke about last week, and this work that we're uh, in Hewaka Ekenoa, you know, there's kind of deepening our understanding about what it means to go back into this historical trauma space and not just uncover trauma, because that's not the purpose in a sense. It's, it's the healing that's required to address um, the layers and layers of trauma. And, and I think the, the relief of guilt and, you know, junior and mamai and ambivalence around where we stand. I think, you know, it is about enhancing mana and, and having mana, reclaiming that uh, for ourselves. But thank you um, for that question. I'm really conscious we need to move on. So I've got a question here. Sorry, I can just see um, John Walden's put in a comment around using whakatauki uh, with whānau in the family violence cases. It's been very rewarding for both parties and helped focus Cordia on the relationship both parties wanted to address. And I think that is what whakatauki can enable us to do, can enable us to focus in on that. And I also remember uh, a number of whānau talking about uh, what having access to some mātauranga Māori that they didn't have access to before enabled them to do was to understand their backstory, was to understand what it, you know, the things that had been happening, and that this whole kind of, um, you, you know, the impact of colonisation, how it's regendered us, how it's removed us from collective responsibility, how all those things have happened to us, that, that within Whakatauki we can bring forward ways of bringing that back together and ways of re-understanding and regenerating our own tikanga and that has come up quite a lot. We also know there's a lot of evidence that says that our cultural reconnection is really important to our ways of understanding ourselves in our relationships with each other. Thank you, Leonie. Another question, I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A but there are clearly a lot of comments coming up in the chat as well. So this one is from Marjorie. Leonie, you mentioned that it wasn't a surprise that whakatauki were shared by our kaikōrero. Can I ask you though, with over 60 hui, how did it feel when you both started to see all of the themes across the project? Did it meet your expectations? Um. Having done uh, work with Tutamohini and uh, Te Pinoranga before, uh, Linda and I, we, we've had a really kind of good, um, you know, we've been fortunate to have had Māori practitioners who are doing the work, you know, constantly uh, talking to us about the things that come up. And, and more than that, just those organisations, many other organisations. We've worked with Heather Clark, we've worked with a whole range of people. Um, and so the themes that come up are not necessarily new themes. And, and I think most Māori providers know, you know, what the, we know what the themes are. What comes up is people's way of dealing with those themes that kind of gives us um, new ways of understanding and, and some of the whakatauki that come up. So I, you know, thinking about um, the impact of, you know, violence and, and notions of prevention and intervention, um, you know, I would not have thought myself about the whakatauki kawe mate fiki me matu, mate uru. I wouldn't have thought about that whakatauki in relation to this area um, until, you know, the, the person who shared it talked about that thing of moving through the hard times of that, the violence from the state, there is an act of resistance and strength. So those, those things that come up, I think that we can never, we can never hear enough from each other as Māori, about how we can draw on these because we can only draw on um, the guidance that we have from what we know. And so we get all of this other, you know, incredible information. The Pūdāko area, because we know that Pūdāko is incredibly important to telling our histories and we know that if we don't know our histories, we have a 
disconnect. Um, and so within the Pudako, there are ones that we have heard before um, that organizations have used before, like Ngakai Tiaki Modi, Te Ohaki a Hine. Um, Hine Wirangi used that, the, the story of Hine, uh, Hine Ahone, Hine Chitama. There's a Pudako that is used often. Uh, and then we hear it again, but we hear someone else's take on it and the way that they apply it. We hear the story of Niwareka uh, and the way in which Niwareka uh, went home to the Rohinga. So we hear those stories, but we also, there are other stories that are iwi specific and whānau specific and hapu specific that we can never really have an expectation on. And, and I think there are a couple of really big things that came up that we haven't heard a lot of before because we haven't asked the questions before. And that's the thing about Rangahau, right? If you don't ask the question, you're not going to get the answer. Or if you ask the wrong question, you're going to get an answer, but it's not necessarily going to be applicable. So being very intentional about asking people, do you think Mataka has a role to play in our healing? Uh, has brought forward a huge amount of conversation and discussion around Mataka that we haven't seen in that depth in previous work. Uh, and the other one that a number of Fano talked about was kai when Mataka came up, the kind of kai that we eat, the way in which certain kai impacts on our behavior, things like sugar, you, you know, or, and, and because Mataka came up, it meant kai came up and emotions came up. And, you know, and the relationship of marama and um, living atua or menstruation came up. All these things came up um, that we know we've been doing bits about, but we hadn't asked those questions before. And so I think we're just really the tip of the iceberg at the moment. Uh, there's a huge amount more um, to do. And I see someone you know, making comment around Taina's work around takipu, you know, um, takipu, ata, uh, all those frameworks, and we've got many other frameworks that are out there that we're aware of, tuakiritanga, um, that people are using, and um, we're just trying to find a space for people to share that uh, together, collectively. One more question, that's all we've got time for, uh, which is in that Q&A box. Most people seem to have used the chat, uh, but we're Where's the research going to end up and who will it be shared with in the coming year, Leonie? Okay, well, in, in many ways, the research, because of the nature of how we do this, Mahi, so you know, Linda and I um, uh, and others in the team have the kind of, you know, the kairangahau role, the research researcher role, but there are other members of the team, other practitioners. And so um, people like Ngarope, people like uh, BJ at Tipuna, um, Oranga, Ariana Wilson, who was working at the beginning on behalf of, of Tanya Mataki, who's been, you know, Tanya was very influential uh, in what we did. Hini Wirangi, um, you know, Rihi uh, Tenana, Betty Seal, people that are working in the field. Uh, you know, they take this work out anyway. So it's already um, influencing and, and they're already sharing it. We've, we've got a number of ways that we're sharing it. Um, COVID kind of has stopped us from going out. And so this is why we've got this webinar series. We have, uh, you know, a lot of plans of being able to go out and share it, uh, share this kind of cordial with the whānau and with organisations that we haven't been able to do. Um, we do a policy-related uh, kaupapa soon, and we've been working with Marama Davis and Sandra um, PP in terms of the, the that team, um, the te ropu, Ngāropi was on the interim te ropu. So there's kind of lots of ways that it gets shared out through many um, different frameworks, and, um, and we're going to continue to do that. And, and so people who have registered for this, we're going to keep sharing out as much as we can um, to you all, we do have a conference that we want to do, um, which we keep moving back because we really want to do it face to face, and that's been hosted uh, by Te Puna Oranga in Ōtautahi. Uh, and if you're interested, you can just uh, request the information through the through the registration. Um, at the moment, we've kind of pushed it back to July, and if we have to, we'll push it back again because we really want to try and do this kanohi kite kanohi and actually have some good time together. 
Um, if we can't, then um, due to COVID, then we'll take it online and, and people will get notification of that. So it's kind of constant sharing. We don't really wait till the end, so to speak, but we try and share it out as much as we can. Thank you, Leone. Um, I think we've come to the end of our session and I know there are a whole lot of unanswered questions. And it's not that I couldn't um, read them out, but my mouse has failed. So can only uh, work on what I've got in front of me. But uh, to, all, to all you uh, participants who we can't see, we just want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. The video will be uploaded, um, so you will all get access to that by registering. And I just want to acknowledge wherever you are, whether and whatever part of the country you happen to be in at the moment, uh, ngā mihi kia koutou. And on your behalf, I just want yeah. to, again, thank Leone for all her work in this space and for sharing uh, with us this afternoon. And I will now turn back to Hiri Aroha. Tēnā koe e te ahora mi Leone, korua korulinda, mō ngā whakatauki, ngā whakatauaki, ngā kua whakapuaki, hei aha, hei ora ngā mō te tangata o te rā mō te whānau whānau i tēnei te mahi. Anā ka hiki nga tā tātou nei hui hui nga, Hikitia, 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 te rongo mai kati o tēnei o ngā hui o he waka o te kaupapa o he waka iti noa. Tuku a kia ia, tuku a kia oi, ko rangi nui, ki ronga ko whakatuna ki te raro. Tūturi whakamaua, kia tēnā, kaimie, huie, tāiki. Tēnā tātai. Tēnā tātai.